and welcome to Into the Hemaverse, your podcast for everything going on in the Hemaverse. I, of course, am your host, uh, Colin Vredenberg. I'm here with my co-hosts, David Rao in the top left, hey. and Nathan Graparis in the bottom half for now, until our guest comes out. Guys, how are you doing this week? Fantastic. Pretty good, pretty good. Good. Uh, we did take a week off, uh, so we apologize for that. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in and around the nation and in our personal lives. So we decided to take a week off. Uh, But this week we were back with a very special guest. Bill Grandy is here in the waiting room, ready to talk uh, about armored fighting with us. Uh, But first let's do a little bit of news. Uh, Last week, Nathan, you talked about, um, well, two weeks ago, Nathan, you talked about uh, Devin Borman's uh, Duello TV GoFundMe. Um, I believe they are either right at or just under halfway on their GoFundMe. So that's an amazing outpouring from the community. Um, Please, 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 if you can, if you're, if you're, if, if you're able to donate, please do. Also, they're giving away like a lot of stuff along with like you, you donate, you get videos. Uh, They're, he is putting a ton of content out there and, and a lot of it free as well. So please, please, please give that a uh, look. I'll put a uh, link in the description. Yes, uh, they're week. awesome people. Give them money. 100%. Uh, Love your money. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> the other thing in the news um, is the Distressed Lecture Series put on by the Sacramento, uh, Sacramento Sword School uh, is airing at the same time as we're recording, so unfortunately, uh, I'm missing it. Uh, but this week is Tan Poi, uh, who is a fantastic Destreza practitioner. And if you recall from episode one, someone I mentioned I would love to have as a guest on the program. Um, his lecture series will be available on YouTube tomorrow morning. And that's about the same time as we'll be releasing this video. So it should be available to you as you watch. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about armored fighting. Guys. What is your experience with armored fighting? I think David should go first. I think David should go first. <laughs> you guys. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so armored armored fighting, or you'll hear the term Harnessechten use, which is German for armored fighting. <laughs> um, is it now? And, and actually, people will use that term a lot, but that's really only appropriate if you're talking about German armored combat. And there are other like, you know, Fiore and Italian sources that deal with armored combat as well. So, uh, but armored combat is basically fighting while wearing uh, armor uh, as opposed to unarmored combat, which is when you're not wearing armor. And uh, it's, uh, there's a lot of differences between the way you approach a fight with someone who's wearing armor and someone who's not wearing armor. Obviously the purpose of armor is to protect you. So there's a lot less target for you to hit, right? So you have to, you know, uh, aim for the weak points, the holes, the the gaps in the armor. Um, Whereas if you're not wearing armor, you can basically hit them wherever you want. So we'd say Um, that you're pretty experienced with this. Uh, yes and no. Um, so, I mean, I've been doing chemo for close to 20 years now. Um, and I've been, a lot of, a lot of people that do chemo do armored combat in the sense that they learn the techniques for fighting in armor. Um, but because armor is very expensive, most people don't actually have armor. Um, so they, they, they can learn kind of the techniques and how they work, but it's one thing to do that. And it's another thing, another thing entirely to put on armor and actually like do it. Um, and I've been lucky enough that in the past few years, I've been able to start putting my, uh, my, my, my harness together. Uh, it's mostly complete. Um, and yeah, armored fighting is really, really cool. It is like nothing else i've ever experienced it's 
awesome and terrifying at the same time. <laughs> but your time, but your your harness is from a very particular time period too. Right? Yeah, it's uh, it's a late late uh, 14th century, very late 14th century style. Um, uh, and uh, like so, when we talk about harness fighting or armor combat we're talking about a period of several hundred years, right? So, so people will have armor from the 14th century, 15th century, 16th century, and armor changed greatly over that time period. So it really, uh, even some of the techniques that you would, you would use uh, will vary depending on um, what time period you're looking at. Uh, another thing actually just to point out, because people think of, unarmored fighting and armored fighting but the reality is that uh, a lot of, and i'm sure we'll get into more of this when we talk with bill but a lot of medieval combat would have occurred between people who might have been partially armored or you know someone is armored someone's not armored someone's wearing a helmet someone's wearing a breastplate and so there's um you know you can look at them as two separate things but if you really want to understand medieval combat, you really have to do both of them because they really do mesh together. Hmm. All right, Nathan, what's your uh, what's your experience? <laughs> none. I won't say none. But um, so while I don't have uh, have any armor of my own, uh, I, I'd like to get some at some point. But um, me and a couple of the uh, the other senior fences in the club over the last year and a half ish, we've been experimenting with kind of like mock uh mock harness vectin basically you know we'll, we'll we'll be in our normal hema gear with padded gamisons and the mask and, and gloves and all that stuff but the only valid targets are like the armpits and the throat basically if we were wearing armor you know roughly a, a rough approximation of what would count hmm. you know so if somebody you know strikes somebody in the hands or whatever then it, it doesn't count and we don't stop the fight we just keep going until somebody like i said gets stabbed through half sorting or otherwise in the armpit or in the, or in the neck or like in the, in the, in the elbow joint where the gaps in the armor would be. Cool. Um, do you do any like plastic plates or anything? Cause I know like some, they do sell some plasticky plate things that kind of mimic armor. Um, we don't, we don't, we don't have any that we particularly work with. Like if somebody happens to have that as part of their HEMA gear, then it's, you know, it, it, it is what it is, but, like I said, it's by and large just to get a rough approximation of what that would be like. Mm -hmm. Now, I will say in the past month, what is this now? June, I guess. Yeah, in the past month, um, one of one of my club members uh, na name dropped him because he's because a pretty cool guy, Patrick Eldridge. He uh, he has not donated but lent a couple of um, just kind of standard harnesses to the club. Mm -hmm. So that while he, because he works out of town a lot, so that while he works out of town, we can experiment with harness vectin so that when he comes back, he has somebody to do it with. That's pretty cool, so, actually. Very cool. I, and yeah, I, and I actually cool. know him. I met him at Purple Heart Open. He's a really cool guy. Um, I think I actually had him in my sword and buckler pool, maybe. I think I did. Uh, but yeah. Possibly so. Blackbeard. Yeah, yeah. T tall guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, compared to you and me. <laughs> okay. All of us. Cool. Uh, so yeah. all, of, all three of us. Yeah. Everybody but Bill. Uh, don't bring out the measuring stick next time you meet us at a tournament. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> my experience with armored fighting is le goose egg. Um, though I definitely am going to buy a harness at some point, And I already have my harness pretty much picked out. Um, obviously, my last name is Vredenberg. So like that carries some some uh, some like very specific time period-y kind of stuff with it like specifically like the dutch 80 years war and i was gonna model and i've got my whole thing like set up i'm like ready to buy it whenever i can get together like i think it's like eight grand or something it is not cheap yeah uh at minimum well no, i'm saying okay i should say it's eight grand for just the queer ass and and Ber and like bergenette with the um I cannot remember. You know what? I'll ask Bill when he comes on. Uh, <laughs> but uh, who, by the way, Bill helped me pick this out. So kind of pretty awesome. I have to make Bill help me too. Yeah. Like he is just an absolute wealth of knowledge. So 
uh, let's bring him on because he, A, he, we have a lot to talk about armored fighting. Uh, like I said, he's a, he's a wealth of information and he's got the, the feel good story of 2020 to tell us all about, uh, losing his armor in the United States Postal Service and then finding it again. Uh, let's welcome on to the show, Bill Grandy. All right. Welcome, Bill Grandy, to the show. Uh, you are well known throughout the community as a researcher, a coach, an instructor, and a true pillar of the HEMA community at large. Uh, so you're here today to share your expertise at uh, fighting in armor. Uh, so, Bill, welcome. Hey, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> For episode number three, I know. Yeah, we got it early. We got you so soon. <laughs> it's almost like we know you or something. <laughs> cool, man. So, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, we just kind of just went over ourselves, what our experience is. Obviously, David is by far the mo most experienced of the three of us. Um, but let please introduce yourself a little bit. Tell us about you know your experiences in HEMA and, you know, your experiences with armored fighting. Sure. So, uh, pretend like we don't like, know you. Uh, <laughs> well, much like in, in your first episode where David was talking about the early days at VAF, Virginia Academy fencing for anyone who doesn't know, that's, that's where, uh, I teach. I'm the, uh, the director of historical swordsmanship there. Uh, Back then, when we first started, there was no such thing as HEMA. That was a term that, I don't even know when that term started coming around, something like 2006, 2007. But uh, I have uh, been teaching there professionally um, since about 2000, 2001, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's been a while. I, I've been doing sword art since I was a little kid. I did foil fencing when I was a little kid in the, the 80s. And... Um, like I was doing Aikido throughout my teenage years. I uh, was doing stage combat throughout high school and college. Uh, around, while I was still in college, around 98 is when I started doing the historical, historical fencing. Well, a lot of us called it that back then. And wow. that's when I really started getting involved with this. Mm. Uh, I started at BAF. Uh, a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, think I founded the program there. I didn't. Uh, there was a guy, Steve Adkison, who David is one of the few people who would actually remember him. Because um, uh, that's Steve. actually back when I met David. <laughs> um, and it was a different time. Uh, hey. It's easy to look back at those days where we were putting on fencing masks, and getting modified Chennai, and just beating the crap out of each other. Modified Chennai, I remember those. Oh, man. Let me tell you, those days were glorious. But, All right. but you still have those, right? When I took my introductory class, that's what we used. Yeah, we still use Shania as the cheap uh, get people started. It's something to put in people's hands because they're like with, with like bucks, with, right? with uh, PVC pipe on the sides for the cross guards, right, right? They're dirty. Yeah. You can put them in someone's hands, especially little kids, right? We mm -hmm. put them in their hands, and hopefully, we don't get a lawsuit from that, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Just back then, it was a very, very different scene. And so officially, my armored combat technically starts in 1998. But re the reality is it took a while. Because back then, you know, when I first got into this, when I started working on, uh, you know, the what we call the, the Kunstfestions now, right? Um, back then, it was just all the historical fencing. Mm -hmm. I remember going on to the old Hacka boards. And I, in case you don't know, Hacka, the Historical Armed Combat Association, oh is what eventually became ARMA. Um, that's how long ago that was. So that was John Clements's original group. And we'd be on these forums discussing things. And Jörg Bellinghausen had put up this incomplete translation of Ringek. And I remember being just so amazed and fascinated by it. And I'm reading through it. And I remember reading like this, the Zverkow section and it's telling you, okay, you're supposed to strike with the short edge and put your thumb on the bottom. And I'm like, what does this mean? What does this mysterious <laughs> arcane knowledge mean, right? And I remember that took forever to figure out what a Zverkow was. So that's why I say, when I say my armored combat 
starts in 1998. That's, <laughs> that's a little bit of a dicey date to put that. Um, but I was just right from the beginning, really fascinated with the armored part. I wanted to get into that as soon as possible. And I was still in college um, and I commissioned my first piece of armor, which I still use. That's my, my cuirass, the, uh, the torso piece, mm. a guy named John Gruber, who um, I was apparently his first customer back then. And he made for me this really, really nice cuirass. By today's standards, there's things that could be changed. And in fact, my current armor, Josh Davis uh, of Davis Reproductions, he's done a lot of modifications on it to mm. make it better. But it was a big deal, um, and especially at that age, because I was in college, it was a lot of money. Yeah. But I was so excited, right? I, was, I just had to get into this. Mm. And uh, so I started out with very, very minimal armor, which is honestly the case to most people who do armored combat. Right? Sure. You, start yeah. out, you start out with your standard, you, know, you have a fencing mask and a sword, right? That's honestly the way to go to begin with, because that's how you start learning how to just do the techniques. And what I always tell people is people want to buy the armor right away and great, more power to you if you can afford it. But the truth is you've got to start just learning the stuff. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the techniques you learn out of armor, right? Wrestling, I hear too many people talk about like, oh, you, you can't understand how to do the techniques until you do it in armor. And I disagree. You can't understand the techniques until you learn them out of armor first. And then you put the armor on. You know? Yeah, I mean, I can I can imagine that it's not like, uh, well, I haven't even I haven't even learned like wrestling generally. Uh, well, <laughs> and and that's one of those things that people don't really think about. Like, even probably the most fundamental thing to fighting in armor armor is wrestling. Like, wrestling is probably the most important skill to learn because in armor you're almost always going to end up <laughs> wrestling. Because you're not just going to hit the person and kill them. Uh, Even when you're on horseback, yeah. you end up wrestling. Hey, I mean, <laughs> I, I you don't have you don't have to sell me. I got injured <laughs> real bad because I didn't know how to wrestle. That's exactly mm -hmm. what happened. I'm 100 percent on board. Everybody should learn how to wrestle first. And uh, a great source that's it's a little less technical is uh, Pietro Monte. Monte has all sorts of things about just general training, and he talks about things like the importance of of wrestling out of armor to learn it in armor um mm -hmm. in fact david definitely knows this quote but there's a part where he talks about the importance of wrestling with a doublet because some people would wrestle without a shirt on and he talks about how important it is to get used to having something that your opponent grabs and how important it is for you to be able to grab things beyond just the limbs because it means that you are better prepared for armor mm. Yeah, and when you're wearing armor, there are a lot of things to grab. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, even when you're wearing, like, the poofy clothes, like, when I wear my poofy clothes, there's so much to grab. Like, there's a there's the flap here and the... Oh, yeah. Um, it's interesting because if you look at some of the wrestling treatises from the earlier time periods, from, you know, like, the, the mid and late 15th century, where they're tending to wear very tight-fitting pants, mm -hmm. And you look at stuff from, you know, the era of Marozzo and, and later where they're wearing the, the poofier pants, you'll see actions where, uh, for example, a common one in the, the early treatises is to reach between the legs and it tells you to grab the buttocks to do the throw. And then the later ones, it's telling you to grab the poofy pants, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Cool. So let's talk about... You know, let's talk about your armor. Not the feel good story of 2020. We'll get to that. Um, <laughs> well, I want it now. <laughs> we'll do that towards the end. But I really want to talk about uh, your armor, like how you procured it. And I'll put up a picture for those at home to see um, your specifically your harness because it is it is legitimately fantastic. Um, so, so talk to us a little bit about your armor and putting it together and, and how you, I don't know if there's any good pictures of the current version of it, but, um, uh, yeah, so it has been an ever growing, ever evolving process because, um, so the way I went about it is piecemeal. I would get one piece at a time and I definitely went the route of getting inexpensive pieces to supplement the nicer pieces early on. Mm -hmm. For example, I, for years, used uh, the cheapo windless steel craft arms because they were 
adequate. They worked well enough and they were dirt cheap. I think I actually got them uh, for something like like 45 bucks. So you can't beat that price. No, you can't. And I was perfectly willing for them to get destroyed. And they never truly got destroyed. They got messed up, but not destroyed. And then eventually I would upgrade to something nice. Mm-hmm. And that's basically how it would work is I would um, – I had a few – pretty nice people early on and then i just kept upgrading and the the inexpensive pieces got me fighting they got me out there and i also spent a long time just using a fencing mask before i actually had a helmet so the early days i didn't use a helmet uh because i couldn't afford it not a custom nice one and for our requirements uh like a lot of the the makers especially when i was first starting were very geared towards things like sda combat so they didn't quite make things that were really what I needed. Mm. And then um, the opposite side is you had people who were focusing on living history, which is closer to what we need. But the truth is a lot of them also are focusing on things that are less about what we need for our modern safety. So uh, a lot of the historical helmets, uh, there's reasons for things to have larger openings on the face that are dangerous for what we do because of things like you spend a lot of time historically, or, or I should say, people did historically spend a lot of time marching or riding horses to battle and so on where they didn't want their whole face covered. They had to worry about waves of arrows and so on. So they need to have higher vision. And there's a lot of things that they made sacrifices because for the overall combat, they needed it. But for our purposes, what we do when we're doing our sparring, we need certain levels of safety that at the time kind of didn't exist. So, uh, like, to this day, I tell people, when you're first starting, use your fencing mask and work with people who are not trying to bash your skull and who understand you're trying to practice and learn and who are going to hold back a little bit and work with you with what you've got. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I, I have to say, like, uh, I can't even imagine. I don't, I don't even particularly feel comfortable wearing a cloth mask to the grocery store, which we all do. Considering that that might be iron and right in my face, there's got to be some, like, is, is there, like, a claustrophobic effect that kind of takes hold? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> like, ah. uh, and that is something I actually warn a lot of people that if you're claustrophobic, you kind of have to train a little. And actually, I am not claustrophobic, but if I have... If I've had a period, you know, my training goes up and down over the years, right? There, there'll be a period where I spend a lot more time teaching than I do actually doing my own training. And if I've gone away from it for a little while and I jump back in and I put my helmet on, I start fighting um, and I'm a little bit more out of shape, I can actually have a little bit of a, maybe not a full blown panic attack, but where I'm like, yeah, I'm starting to get like really well, panicky for lack of a better word because of it. And there's apparently a physiological thing because it's not purely about the air. Um, There's a little bit of a combination of lack of oxygen and uh, the inability to just be able to open it really fast. The way, like a fencing mask, you can take off really fast. Sure. A helmet, you have to mess with it a little. Mm -hmm. And at least our modern HEMA helmets, that's true. And there's apparently an actual physiological thing that is both physical and psychological about that. Hmm. Um, if I'm, if I'm regularly training in it, then I don't have that problem at all. So hmm. yeah, yes. the, <laughs> the first few times I, when I got my, my helmet, which is, a uh, uh, late, late 14th century, uh, style, uh, helmet. So in order to make it safe for what we do, the visor needs to be able to kind of lock in place. Although at that time period, that wouldn't have that, that wouldn't have been like a locking mechanism, right? It would just just gravity kind of holds right. it down. But because while we're fighting, it might get knocked up and get hit in the face. There has to, we have to have a way to secure it. So my helmet actually has a strap on it that that keeps the visor in place. Uh, the problem is I can't undo it myself. So uh, the first few times I also have asthma, right? So the first few times I uh, wore that and. You start getting a little bit out of breath and you start being like, I can't breathe. And then you're start kind of panicking. Cause you're like, I can't get this off my head. I can't get, and it's, it, it can be a little terrifying. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I'm I'm re- I'm starting to rethink it already. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you you do get used to it though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing that I've been told is the the heat too, because it like obviously you know even though it's you know it's metal, it's not it's reflecting you're, some sunlight, but it's still got to be hot in there. You're right that it is hot. Like anything, you get used to it. Um, so I've the heat is actually one of the. F- one of the things that has never actually bothered me, even if it's a really hot day, mm-hmm. uh, it's never bothered me the way you think it would. The The breathing is honestly a bigger issue. And even that, like David said, you get used to it. You adapt to it. Mm-hmm. Um, the more you train in it, the easier it is to do. So. Yeah. And uh, if you're wearing, uh, you know, the, the clothing, what you're wearing under your armor, uh, if you're wearing the pro- appropriate type of, you know, clothing, it's going to be wicking the sweat away from your body. And then that's going to be cooling you down. So yeah, honestly, yeah. Like heat, Un- like under armor, you'll, you'll, you will sweat a lot. Yeah. Like I always sweat a ton, yes. but I don't, I don't really feel hot. Huh. Yes. I have my queries constantly has these droplets of rust after I've been fighting that if I don't clean it immediately, it's just the sweat droplets dripping in a very specific pattern. But, uh, man, don't you wish that, you had a squire? <laughs> <laughs> oh man okay so uh let me ask you then for for nathan and i who are kind of noobs at this but we both definitely want to get involved in it um where where would somebody start like where where do you think you'd start now? so there's there's different approaches to this and um the, the ultimate thing that's always very important is because people ask me all the time that i don't know where to start you start without armor. Okay? You start training as if you have armor. You start going through the techniques. You start doing drills. You wrestle like crazy. Uh, the more you wrestle out of armor, the easier it is to learn to wrestle in armor. And you spend a lot of time doing that. And even after you have the armor, the majority of your training is still going to be without most of the armor. Okay? Mm. Um, but to start out with where you buy the armor that's that's a complicated one and it depends on what you want to do mm. so I'll, I'll start out talking about the two extreme opposite views about it the first one being uh, you save up your money and you buy once you buy it right so you you save up and make sure you get exactly the right thing mm. and there's value to that especially if you're looking at the long term yeah. it just means you need to know exactly what you want before you drop 20 grand and mm. That's, and that's you, and you need 20 grand. <laughs> <laughs> um, and people do it this way. I myself did not do it that way. Right? I teach fencing for a living. I sure as hell can't afford that. But uh, I ended up doing it the piecemeal way, which is honestly a lot more realistic for most people. And the truth is, that's also historical. People who bought full suits of armor, we're talking essentially Emperor Maximilian did it, right? If you're the emperor, you do it. And by the way, he essentially went bankrupt from buying too much armor. So <laughs> that is something that, yes. That's the way to go. <laughs> we, we have actual bankrolls of armors being like, you can't pay me? Well, then I'm not finishing this armor for you. So, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, but the, the piecemeal way is both historical, but it's also a lot more realistic for people. So the other thing is you have to kind of know what you want to buy. So armor, it just covers a huge time span and you do not want to mix and match from different time periods. Um, Partially because we we recreate historical martial arts. So in order to really understand what we're recreating, you want to have something that's at least reasonably similar to what we're training for, right? Mm. You also don't want things that are so far apart in time that they don't function together. There's certain things that just do not function with other pieces. So, uh, for example, if you wanted to do an earlier harness, if you look at the plate harnesses from the late 14th and early 15th century, which is actually what what David does, that tends to be easier to get into. Now, that doesn't mean it's automatically cheaper. Um, It can be. It has the potential to be cheaper because the the way the pieces are are a little more mix and match than later period harnesses. Mm. Um, it has the potential to be cheaper. It also has the potential to be just as expensive depending on what you want. But we're talking about essentially a shirt of mail. You, you need proper uh, arming clothing underneath. Mm-hmm. And uh, you get that stuff. You get a shirt of mail. There's pieces you can then put on. like your, You can do a breastplate. You don't necessarily have to get the full 
front and back, which is the, the clearest, which tends to need to fit you much more closely. So it, that can be more expensive. Um, you get a helmet, you get gauntlets, you already essentially practically have a suit of armor right there without even covering your arms and legs necessarily. Mm. And then those are things you add to it. But uh, going back to what I was saying earlier, what you really need to do is use your HEMA gear for a long time. Um, there's shortcuts you can do just for training. So a fencing mask, of course, uh, you can treat that as if it's an open face helmet. You can uh, take a standard HEMA jacket, right? Like, for example, like a Spets jacket. If you put on one of those and then you take uh, a plastic chest protector and stick it on the fronts, mm -hmm. you look stupid as hell. But if your goal is just to practice, what that plastic chest protector does is it gives your opponent a visual cue of where the plate is. And you train like that, right? You take, especially if you have like the bulky spes gloves, those are great for just pretending they're dominance uh, because they're nice and bulky. They give you about the same range of movement of, of actual steel gauntlets. <laughs> and they're something that, again, your partner has a visual cue of where are the squishy parts and where's the plates. Hmm. So you use this gear with the knowledge, of course, it's lighter than real steel armor. Of course, it's not the same, but it's something that you can at least do drills with. It's something that you can do limited sparring with to understand, you know, what, what's target area, what's not target area. And in that way, it's not all in your imagination. You actually have visual cues of things, and then you start adding pieces over it. But like I said, you have to research what kind of armor you want. Um, if you want... For example, I wear uh, something that's a uh, very late 15th century, arguably early 16th century, and it's uh, more Gothic style, so it has lots of fluting and so forth. It's not cheap to do that. There are cheap, off-the-rack Gothic armors out there that are honestly pretty terrible. I've seen people fighting them. You know, it's you can get them to work adequately, but there there are easier ways to get into armor if your goal is function, and then if you try to buy these like super fluted stuff worth on the cheap, they tend to be garbage. So it's, it's easier to get stuff that is, is simpler. And then when you're ready, you get custom stuff. Sure. So when you say garbage, um, there's like a really specific, and we've talked about this before, cause I I've attended a couple of your seminars and we've talked about this personally. Um, but when you say garbage, you're, you're kind of talking more about function than you are. I mean, yes, looks, obviously, but it, it, it's, a, it's a... I am talking about both. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but it's primarily like a functional thing, right? That you're saying when you say right. garbage. So a great example is anything that covers your torso. The vast majority of off-the-rack armor, you know, just stuff that's just being mass-produced, tends to be done from a costuming point of view. So, for example, our modern aesthetic when we buy pants and we get our waist size, it's not actually our waist size. It's like just above the hips. We wear our pants pretty low compared to the actual waist size. At least most of us do. Right. Mm -hmm. And that means that because our, our modern aesthetic is based off that, when you look at plate armor, that's made without thinking about function, it tends to also sit very low. That means the entire thing is uh, it's resting on your hips, which not only does that prevent you from, from folding, right? Whenever you, you fold your, your spine, whenever you get into any sort of guard, it doesn't allow you to move properly. And it, it, it mm -hmm. honestly can be painful in some cases, but it's also putting all the weight on your hips and that's painful too. Mm. Um, you need it to end around the base of, it was a little bit below the rib cage and that allows you to actually fold forward. It allows you to actually hinge where you need to hinge. And, that's a gigantic thing that the vast majority of mass produced armors don't even pay attention to because you know, most of them just don't realize. Yeah. They're kind of, they're for looks, right? Like they look, they want you to mm -hmm. look like the knight in shining armor. They don't need you to right. actually bend down and pick up the sword off the ground once you drop it. Right. Um, and actually this, Oh, good. Something that I would add in, add in as well. Um, uh, a, a slight side note. So while I haven't done any uh, any actual armored fencing or armored fighting myself, uh, for about three years I think I worked with a, worked at a um, an armor shop at our local Renaissance Festival every fall, and I would spend you know I don't know like four or five weekends out there just kind of like learning how to make armor, and you know people would people would bring in would bring in this this armor that they bought off of some random website online, and one of the consistent things that the uh, the master armor told me. Because like he, he trained under some very, very well-known armor who, you know, trained under somebody else and he, he knows his stuff. And 
he would show me show me a pair of gauntlets or something and you know say I, I know that these came from some random website because the steel was really really soft mm. like it, it, it wasn't properly tempered it wasn't spring steel it what like they were heavy but still even though they were heavy because the steel was thick it was still really really soft steel and people would come in and say hey i bought these somewhere can you fix them for me and he would just be like no i'm not going to mess with that because it's, it's trash to begin with yeah that's true although i will point out historical steel the way they made them it very dependent on time period and and uh culture because for example a lot of the 15th century milanese armors um a lot of it is they intentionally use soft steel because you could bang it back into shape and uh, hmm. that, that's that's something that actually I would, I would argue is debatably historical depending on what type of armor uh, unless it's japanese katanas <laughs> <laughs> they have curved swords. Curved <laughs> swords. Uh, they can cut the tanks, guys. <laughs> but but I mean, you are right because a lot of a lot of the cheaper stuff, you know, how do they make it cheaper? They cut corners. So they, they sometimes do use inferior materials. I find the bigger issue is they also uh just look at an object and go, okay, I need to make something that basically looks like it, and they don't understand all the intricacies it'd be like if i looked at a car and said i can make that right i can't make a car yeah right? i have no hammer, clue hammer, hammer. what to do but it if looks I like a car look, now. yeah if i looked at a picture on the internet and then went okay let me just start getting some metal parts and start putting it together obviously it wouldn't be a functional car but it's the same thing there's a lot of very subtle integral parts that you don't really understand unless you truly understand the armor inside and out right the guys who really know what they're doing have really understand the original pieces and understand how certain pieces articulate, right? Um, if they don't articulate a very specific way, then they they just don't function right. Here's a, a weird one. So almost all, uh, like David, he wears a bassinet, which is the, the style where, um, at least his style is a visored one, right? So it's, it's, it's a late 14th century, um, early 15th century style that it tends to be kind of somewhat shaped like this. It tends to be completely open here. And then you have two pivots here. Every single just surviving example, the pivots are subtly off from each other. Every single one of them is asymmetrical. And you, if you don't really study it, it's easy to say, well, okay, it's just because medieval people didn't care. But every single one of them is done in a very similar way. And when people looked into it, they realized it's because when you lift uh, the visor up, it holds it up. Um, it's just the tension of it because they're off center holds it up. And if you make them uh, so that they are symmetrical, the visor tends to constantly fall down. This is a great time to move on to the main event now that we're at least 30 minutes into it. Um, Bill, we need you to tell the story of your armor. The story. And, you, uh, and the United States Postal Service. <laughs> I will try to make it short. <laughs> No, it's okay. I like uh -oh. we. I, no, I wanted to block out at least thirty minutes for this. If you let me we, rant, we all want to hear it. It'll be bad. So rant, Bill, rant. <laughs> I need more of this if I'm going to be ranting. Yeah. So, yes. We'll wait. Yeah. Coffee, right? So anyway, short story, which is still too long. <laughs> I had um, sent my armor to Josh Davis. So Josh Davis of Davis Reproductions, he does the vast majority of my armor these days, uh, as well as a bunch of other stuff. Josh is incredible. Um, also made, made my a helmet. Ton of things. What was that? I said also made my helmet. So Yeah, that's right. He made, made David's helmet. He's made a bunch of uh, armor for a bunch of VAF people. Um, he's made all sorts of amazing, amazing stuff too. But um, so... I uh, had to get a few repairs done. I had to get a few adjustments done. So um, typically, whenever I have this sort of thing, I just I send it to him. He fixes it. He sends it back to me, right? Um, so I sent him a large chunk of my armor, and that was last September. Sends it back to me, shows me pictures. Everything looks awesome, right? And he sends it priority two-day mail. And two days pass, and I check the tracking in transit. Three days pass, four days pass, a week, two weeks. I keep checking. 
Uh, I check with them like, hey, you know, it still says in transit. So we start filing and asking for uh, for a missing uh, mail or whatever it's called, right? And Josh being the one who sent it, he's the one who's primarily in charge and he's talking with them. But I'm also talking with people on my end. You know, I go to my local post office because it's impossible to call them. And all of them are like, look, the computer says it's in transit. That means it's on the way to you. And when it's... Bureaucrats. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Two months later, but it says it's in transit, so that means it's on its way, and you know, I'm arguing with stuff. And I'm not even asking, where is my armor? I'm asking, who do I talk to? Who am I supposed to contact? And they're saying, I'm not kidding, saying things like, I don't know, you have to Google stuff like that. So <laughs> two oh, and a half no. months later, where I'm like, clearly I'm never getting my armor back. Like I was crushed. Josh calls me up and is just like, hey, guess what? Uh, you know, this would be last November. Guess what? The armor's been found. I'm like, oh, wow, right? And they sent him pictures. It's in Georgia. Uh, their Georgia office is apparently where essentially all lost mail ends up, okay? Or at least a large portion of it. <clears throat> so they sent him pictures. They show, okay, you know, the label. They had the label. The label had come separate from it. Okay, great. They've got it. And they asked him to fill some stuff out. So he fills it out. And we're all excited about it, right? Finally, you know, I'm two and a half months had gone by and I finally am going to get my armor back. Cause I really, at that point, truly thought it was just gone forever. Then a week goes by, two weeks go by, right? By January, we're like, where the heck is it? Right. And again, I contacted them. I, I talked with multiple people who had no clue and everyone's like, I don't know. And I'm not even, again, I'm not asking where's my armor. I'm asking, who do I call to find out a status update or anything? And no one knows anything about this. No one knows what to look up. Um, I'm just asking for a phone number for the Georgia uh, branch where they found it. And my local USPS like leaves me for 30 minutes and comes back with a handwritten um, mail in note, like the address for it. They're like, I don't, I don't know what the phone number is, but here's their address. If you want to send <laughs> oh my God. Did, so, wait, wait, wait. Was this, was this when uh, the Atlanta Fire Factor guys offered to go to the address, the address and like, look at like they offered, right? Oh yeah. I was like, look, you're welcome to, but like, <laughs> um, let's say at this point, this actually would have been much later. I think when they offered that and I'm like, look, it's, it's gone. Don't even bother. So like, don't, don't get yourself in a legal battle over, over <laughs> yeah. really what it was. So January, um, I actually uh, was, because Josh is out in Minnesota. I had to be out there. So um, I meet up with him and days before I show up, he checks out with them again. And again, no one even had a record of this, even though he had, he's like, look, I have, you know, notes explaining what the case number is. I have pictures and photos. And I was like, I, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know how to look this stuff up. Uh, he talked to someone in January. He was like, okay, uh, yeah, you know, the, the record says we're still looking for it. He's like, what do you mean still looking for it? They're like, well, <laughs> like we never found it. And he's like, I have, I have proof that you found it. He's like, mm, no, we don't know what you're talking about. We ended up <laughs> filing for uh, theft for this because we're like, look, you know, something's gone wrong and nothing. So again, I just assumed this was never happening. And Josh uh, was like, look, man, I feel awful about this. I'm going to remake your armor for you. And that's, that's a big deal, right? Yeah, that's a huge thing. So then fast forward to just a, a few weeks ago, you know, it'd been eight months and Josh was literally about to start my new armor. I had actually just done a full um, torso cast to send him so we can make a new uh, Quiris. And you know, I just sent that out and we're just like, look, the armor is gone, right? It, it will never come back. I was crushed because even with Josh making me a new harness, who knows how long that would take. That would have taken a very long time, right? So I, I was definitely, I'd been without armor for a long time. I was about to be without armor for a much longer time. And out of the blue, he calls me up and he says, like, someone has found your armor, has your armor. And apparently there's a guy who, um, he asked me not to use his name on the internet. So he asked me to use the nom de plume, Otto van Teich. And Otto had been just browsing eBay. He, uh, I think he's an SEA guy. I'm not entirely sure, but he's definitely a person who's very knowledgeable about armor. And um, he goes on eBay, finds somebody who is selling off this beautiful armor. And he's just like, 
wow, that's really cheap. Let me buy that. Buys it. He gets it. He's all excited about this great deal he just got. And um, he had a question for the seller and he asked them. And that's when he discovered the seller bought it from another auction from USPS. And <laughs> USPS, after a certain amount of time, when stuff is lost and unclaimed, they auction it off. And apparently this guy ended up with my armor and then sold it on eBay, not really knowing what it was worth. He sold it for a steal. This guy auto buys it. And let's, let's be honest. Most people, when they find out a good deal on eBay, they don't question it. Right. And even after he found out this guy bought it from USPS, most people will be okay, cool. Right. I got this great deal. This is where character comes in, right? Because Otto's first instinct is, oh no, somebody is crushed. Not, hey, cool, I got a great deal. It was, somebody never got this. Mm. So he goes on the internet and he starts searching around. He starts asking uh, on, on forums and things like that. And he eventually finds out that Josh Davis made it. He gets in touch with Josh. And Josh's like, this is the best news I've had all year. <laughs> so, uh, and it's yeah. Been, and it's been a year. <laughs> <laughs> please, please don't tell me. Please don't tell me that he shipped it to Josh. <laughs> no, no, actually, like, <laughs> they, Josh puts them in touch with me directly. We talk and everything, and I'm just like, "You are an amazing human being." <laughs> so, yeah, he ends up uh, getting it to me. He uh, specifically asked, "Do you not want me to use USPS?" And I'm like, "Please don't." Right? <laughs> I was, I was like, "Pony <laughs> Express," then send it to the USPS again. Um, so he got it to me and it's all in, to, to my shock, in phenomenal condition. I also expected that it would just be a pile of rust because I expected at some point that USPS opened it, right? And looked at it to take pictures and verify what it was. I was shocked that they didn't just leave it sitting in a warehouse where it just got completely rusted for eight months and then just got destroyed. So no, everything is in great condition. I had a minor thing where, um, on the bever of my helmet, uh, some of the rivets had popped loose when I first put it on. That's fixable. Right? That was That's, it? <laughs> That's so, insane. <laughs> yeah, that was incredible. And so... <laughs> That, that's how I got my armor back. And I was doing a charity run, which I, I know in your last episode, you mentioned it uh, um, at the beginning of it. You should have clipped from my video. That was an amazing video. <laughs> <laughs> so that charity was uh, is the Deed of Alms put on by the, the group Hoplologia out in Toronto. So every week they put on a challenge since they couldn't do this, this fundraiser in person. They were doing it on the internet. And they just kept putting out challenges. And the final one was a bonus one. And you could put on your armor and go for a 1k run in it and i was like well obviously i'm not doing that and then the armor shows up right the week that uh that that was the challenge and i'm like well, i kind of don't have an excuse now especially because it's for charity and uh this guy just did this amazing thing for me so i would have felt like an ass if i was just like nah i don't feel like doing the charity run <laughs> So yeah, that's that's the uh, the condensed version of how I got my armor back. Oh, that that's a fantastic. It was I, great. I can't. I remember following this on Facebook. So each update as it came, like yeah. you, like I don't think it was at quite as it came, but you would usually like send an up, put an update on Facebook or whatever. And that's I remember reading some of these, and I'm like, this is terrible. This, this like your armor is some of the most fantastic work, and. It is. Josh does a lot of good work. Your armor is like pretty much his best stuff. <laughs> and I'm thinking, it's gone? It's gone? Oh, no. Uh, and it's like, I'm telling it now, you all know that the armor came back. But let me tell you, the whole eight months, it was just, I'm never getting my armor back ever. Yeah. And all and those like, years of me putting that together, it's gone. So. <laughs> But that's fantastic. Like first Josh offered to completely rebuild the armor for you, which is amazing. <laughs> and then and then the, the guy Otto who bought it ends up actually like thinking, "Hey, this is somebody else's armor that they probably lost." Yeah. That's, that's crazy. That's yeah. like that's like a a solidarity of community that I would never have expected. Yeah, exactly. But like so impressive. I I really wanted to use his real name when I I told the story in my uh, my armor run, but he Understand. He he just didn't want his real name on the internet, so that's why uh, I use that not the clue for him. But. Yeah, 
completely fair. where 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 did he live like like was he's it far texas. away i mean where yeah he's in texas so it's nowhere near me in virginia right <laughs> yeah it was me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're such a beautiful human being nathan i know i know you're welcome bill it, it, it was well, all for me so i figured i'd find you his <laughs> his initial intention was to keep the armor it just didn't fit him the, the helmet was <laughs> up here <laughs> This helmet's made for someone without hair. I can't wear this. <laughs> uh, uh, that's a that's a ten out of ten meme right there. Right, so. oh. Speaking of hair and armor, uh, male and hair does, does not go together. That's why, especially, especially beards. I, I will say, modern male and hair. Well, that's, yes. that's what happened to me. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> well, that's yeah. why I want to do 17th century, so you don't have to wear any mail. It's just plate, right? It's just you know because they did have beards back then, and they had the truly mustaches that would go on on the outside of the. Uh, the yes, mail. I, I know. The like episode. the the William of Orange, like <laughs> if you get a chance to handle actual period mail, and then you handle modern mail, it's night and day. Yeah. It's yeah. like it's smooth like the the way the rivets are are really smooth it just moves like silk um especially the stuff that's really really tiny rings it's it's mind-blowing um and it's because they had apprentices who you know basically were told make a hundred of these today or you don't get to eat tonight so and they didn't have tv or the internet so they had i was gonna say it must have something to do with with uh the the lack of literally anything else to do (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all right well uh, oh go ahead david well one thing I, I actually i thought maybe we should touch on because we haven't touched on this at all uh is the difference between uh what most people think of of armored combat and what historical armored combat was uh as well as the difference between what we do in hema and things like, for instance, Armored Combat League, um, mm-hmm. because and even a lot of people in HEMA, I don't, I don't think really understand the yeah. difference between that. Um, I don't. Well, if you watch the movie Excalibur, that's all you need to know. That is completely <laughs> accurate. Um, no, no, that's a, a good point. Um, so, our period fencing treatises, admittedly, are tend to be very focused on the duel. Not, not 100%, but they, they happen to be, for the armored sections, especially the German stuff, um, they have an emphasis on not attacking the armor, but attacking where the armor doesn't cover, which when you say that, it makes sense, but it's not necessarily intuitive until you think about that. So there's a lot of thrusting to places, for example, the armpits, because if you put plate there, um, with the exception of super late period, really highly advanced armor, um, especially earlier stuff, if you put plate there, you couldn't put your arm down. You would look very silly going onto the battlefield, just like this, right? And so you have to account for any of the places where you need to bend, where you need to be able to breathe, where you need to be able to move. And uh, if you can supplement those places with mail, so essentially the, uh, the links of metal riveted together, that's where you'd have uh, like the armpit at the inside of the elbow and so on but you're targeting those joints with thrusts primarily. Now that's not to say you don't ever strike the plates. You definitely do, but usually as part of entries, right? You strike at the helmet to get to the distance where you can close in and then grasp at the blade to start thrusting into the gaps and so forth. Um, And David brought up other forms of of modern modern armored combat where uh, like the the armored combat leagues and battle of the nations and so forth. Um, That type of stuff, there is value to it, it is a little more in line with some historical tournaments where they put on full armor and struck each other on the armor uh, in the same way that we put on fencing masks and we strike the fencing mask and we treat it as if that's unarmored. Oh man, so, they to- I completely forgot. Uh, they totally do that in uh, uh, a knight's tale at the <laughs> very beginning. Historical accuracy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. It's called a lance. I, I can't Hello. fault anything that uses Queen in the soundtrack. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fair point, honestly. And that includes Flash Gordon. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, Flash Gordon. So, 
regardless, though, like a lot of their tournaments historically did involve them taking blunted swords or or not even always swords, right? Um, sometimes they use what they call whalebone, which was actually baleen, and they would strike at the armor for their various different tournaments and games. And stuff like the Armored Combat League does stuff a little more in that vein. <laughs> uh, very debatable about how, how historically accurate they do it, but it is, you know... A lot of Hema people like to distance themselves from that stuff because they feel like, oh, it's completely 100% wrong. I do understand the knee-jerk reaction to want to distance themselves from something that is not as focused on history. Um, I, I have that same knee-jerk reaction. But there's, I, I also hate to completely trash it because there is actually some stuff about it that I go, all right, that is close to some of the things that medieval people did. But for the life or death combat, the focus was on thrusting at the gaps, at least with the sword. Um, you have also mass weapons like pole axes that you definitely do thrust at the gaps, but you also strike on the helmet and try to really disorient the person through the armor. And um, but oh, go ahead. I was saying, something I mentioned actually before you came on was also that historically not everyone was fully armored. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So you might be striking where they're not wearing armor. Uh, um, and another thing, going back also to like modern armor production, is there's there's going into kind of what your goal is, right? So um, the goal of getting he, you know, harness for HEMA versus harness for living history mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. versus harness harness for like armored combat league. They're all they're all pretty different, right? Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, like historic. Like if you want to have armor that's completely historically accurate, uh, in many cases, as Bill's mentioned, it might actually be too soft for what we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to get we're going to beat beat the crap out of it, even though we're not trying to just smash the armor like they do in Armor Combat League. Um, it still is going to happen, right? So. For HEMA, you usually you want something that's going to be more hardened, something that's going to stand up a little bit longer. And then when it comes to like armored combat the armor, they, they were rich enough to buy new ones. Right, exactly right, um, um, and, and, or have someone on hand who can just fix it for you. Yeah, it was, yeah. I would say it's probably a lot easier in in historical to actually find an armor, whereas today, yes, that's a like, big one. That's a big well, one. not just armor, but there were people whose jobs was to like fix armor as well yeah mm -hmm. at like, tournaments they had armors on site right yeah yeah um and then when it comes to like for instance a lot of people who when they want to get into like hema harness fact and uh they'll go out and they'll say like oh i found this like battle of the nation's armor and it's really good for protecting you but oh, it's not really smashing you is really yeah yeah for, when i want to say for someone smashing you but it's not usually it's not very historically accurate and it's also not really great for what we want to do yeah. with some exception there are some out there that are, are yeah. good and, and actually, there's also i i currently use because i'm building my harness i currently use some uh pieces that were built by uh an armor who does stuff for battle of nations um uh but again there is that difference in in kind of what your goal right. is and then what what kind of what the armor that you, an armorer that you're going to want to find to, to get your armor. Yeah, because uh, there, there is overlap with some of the pieces. Some pieces will pretty much work fine for different forms of combat. Other pieces don't. Um, so one of our guys, Kevin Comer, he got a phenomenal deal on a complete full suit uh, of late Gothic armor that was designed for the Armored Combat League and Battle of the Nations and so forth. And uh, some guy uh, in Eastern Europe had had the whole thing made. It's actually beautiful and used it a few times and then was retiring from it and was selling it for a just crazy cheap price. So he bought this whole thing and it's awesome, but he's also constantly having issues. So for example, the helmet has a gap that would lead a thrust directly to his bare chin. And he had a lot of trouble being able to do things for that. Um, the eye slots were way too big, right? But for that type of combat, there's no thrusting allowed. And what we do, there's tons of thrusting. So he had to get perf plate bolted to the front of it, which uh, it 
doesn't look good, but at least it's safe. But he had all these other issues with that. And then he had other issues with the way it was designed for to be a tank. Um, not only is it crazy heavy, but it's also, uh, it doesn't allow him to move right. So for wrestling, he's actually a very good wrestler outside of armor. And you put the armor on him, he has all sorts of trouble moving. Uh, and that's just because it wasn't designed for that type of thing. So, hmm. so David's and, spot on about that. Interesting. So um, real, real quickly, can we talk about like the differences between like HEMA armored combat versus, because maybe somebody might be familiar with Battle of the Nations, but isn't sure. so familiar with what we do sure. when, when we have tournaments. So when, when we are looking at recreating historical martial arts, what we're looking at is, of course, what the treatises show. And the treatises have a very big emphasis on thrusting into the gaps, okay? Thrusting into any place that's not covered by the plate, uh, with some exceptions, but for the most part, that's the primary technique. And generically speaking, most of the techniques tend to also be using the sword where you grab it in the middle. So you where we normally hold the sword at the hilt, we grab at the blade, and there's various terms for it. Probably the most common term you hear people say is the half sword. And you're using it essentially as a short spear for thrusting into those gaps. Now you also, unlike unarmored combat, um, thrusting into a male covered armpit probably does not end the fight. Um, it probably hurts the person, they're probably bleeding, but they're probably fighting back still. And so unlike the unarmored portion where, you know, cut to the head is going to be kind of a showstopper for the most part in armored combat you more than likely would have to keep fighting and that's where the grappling becomes such a big deal because you might get stabbed you might say ow and you can't just ignore that you have to keep going so you might start to um try to move that out of the path and so you can set up at that distance some kind of throw where you were taking the actual weapon and levering at the person's neck and setting your leg up for a throw. Um, that's where the grappling becomes such a big deal because you end up so close after you have these cases of the point getting in and the guy's not stopping. Or in some cases, just you're going for this tiny gap. And as you go to thrust, it skips off and you're at a very close distance. And that's why David earlier was saying that wrestling is such a vital, vital part of armored combat. Uh, wrestling and dagger combat because... Sometimes you're at a distance where the sword is just too awkward and you let go. And if you can go for your dagger, you go for it. So, but that would be the biggest difference in emphasis is, you know, the, the point work into those gaps and some forms of like a ACL, the armored combat league, uh, some of it involves grappling as well. Although their grappling is definitely with a different focus. Than our, so. Cool. And another thing that, uh, I, I think if you've never experienced, if, if you if you've done if you do HEMA or or fencing, right, and you you've never done armored combat before, uh, it is a very it's a very strange experience, especially the first few times you do it, because you have no idea what's going on. <laughs> you, you can't see, you can't feel, you can't tell what's happening, like. People will be hitting you. You don't realize it. You can't tell sometimes if you're hitting them or you think you're hitting them, but you're not sure. Um, I, I, I always go back to like one of the, well, not the first, but it was um, one of the first times that I really went like, okay, I'm going to go like a full, we were doing it, doing it match. We were testing some rules for, for, for a, a rule set that we're working on. And I was, um, uh, fighting with uh, another person from VAF and we decided, okay, look, we're going to go ahead and we're like, let's, we're going to like take this seriously. And you get into it and all of a sudden you kind of get tunnel vision because you're not sure what's happening and you get in close. And I remember uh, Hank is the guy I was, I was fighting with. He, I know he had his dagger out right? and I'm trying to grab his dagger, but I can't really see what's happening. I can't really feel. And I keep feeling him hitting. So in my head, he's stabbing me over and over and over and over with the dagger and I'm trying to stop it. And I, I can't, I'm just like, what's going on? What's going on? Like, and so I was like, I didn't know what to do. So I just grabbed my sword and I just start smashing him over <laughs> and over and over again. It was again. awesome. <laughs> with, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, um, the, the pommel, 
um, which is a totally legitimate thing to do. It but was it like was, watching a real gladiator fight. <laughs> but what was was crazy was that it was like that's the closest I've ever come to actual fighting because there's like a, a switch that just flipped on in my brain where I literally freaked out because he was stabbing me and I needed to stop him. So it was just like block and then just smash, smash, smash. Um, and it was like like afterwards, like it was exhilarating, but it was also terrifying. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> there's, there's a good line in um, Christian Cameron's book, The Ill-Made Night, which by the way, for any HEMA person, you need to read that book. Yeah. Um, the whole series. Um, but he, he mentions like he's, he's about to fight someone, he pulls his visor down and he says that uh, when you close your visor, you can only, see, you can't see anything but the person in front of you. And he says, I'm sure there's a lesson to be learned in that somewhere. Right? And I actually think that's a great line because it is very true. Plus it's poetic. Right. And that happens a lot when, uh, when we fight. And I think David's, David's idea is good. It is very different than a fencing mask. When you put that visor down, you don't see the world around you. I mean, it's, it's why when you look at most images of people riding a horseback, their visor's up. They don't put it down until they need it. Um, it's also probably why the vast majority of the pictures show them with the visor up, even when they're in close, because it does limit your vision. Um, but David's right. Like, it changes things. I know the first time I really seriously wrestled in armor all right i'd done wrestling out of armor a million times but in armor um my partner and i were just drilling and we were doing stuff where we decided to close our eyes that's a common thing you practice in, in wrestling right and everyone says oh your brain just makes it so you can see that actually was literally the first time i, I i'm wrestling and i i i'm going to use the word literally even though i kind of mean figuratively but i could see everything i closed my eyes and we were wrestling and my brain filled in the gaps. And it was kind of spooky because I could see everything around me. I could see uh, where he was and what position he was and where his, his weight was centered and so forth, even though I had my eyes closed, in a way that didn't happen when I wasn't wearing the armor. And it's probably because your helmet closes off so much that when you close your eyes, it's not different enough. And therefore, your brain fills in the gaps a lot better. So you're saying that even with the blast shield down, you could still, you could see. <laughs> oh, man. I, I, I don't know what that quote is from. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Heard. Uh, I'm with you, I, Bill. I, I was wondering when the Star Wars, because we've been doing that in chat all week. <laughs> what, Which what I have to say, some, yeah, some, some of this, some of this is, is, absolutely fantastic and the rest of it i was just like oh i'm gonna gonna have to groan at that one well here we are at i think almost uh almost an hour and a half into it oh wow can uh, i pull my uh, my my charity real quick my oh yeah there? absolutely no okay, no, no do. we don't have time we don't uh, have time for charity i'll, I'll give you a short introduction because i saw this on facebook and i think it's the coolest idea it is swords without borders is that right please please tell us all about it it's it sounds awesome so so uh what this is this is going to be a fundraiser that i'm running um it's going to start on july 1st i i still have to iron out some of the details but essentially uh it is a fundraiser for doctors without borders who that's already a phenomenal organization anyway um but especially with the recent pandemic with covid-19 things have been a lot rougher so uh, i wanted to do a fundraiser for them and i honestly i was really inspired by the deed of alms that i took part of and also um while this isn't a charity there was the uh so you could so you think you can sword event that academy duello put on and i was one of the judges for that and i was so impressed with the enthusiasm people had for this I was impressed how many people just jumped right in to do this, whether they were experienced or a beginner. I kind of wanted to do something that had that kind of energy. So essentially what this is, this is going to be a raffle. Um, it starts on July 1st and then uh, by July 31st is the end. And then in August I, I do the drawing, but to get entries into the raffle, to get your, your tickets, you number one, you have to donate. Okay, and uh, all the rules will be uh, on the website, but uh, the more you donate, the more entries you get into the raffle. But you get bonus tickets if you do some type of sword video. 
that sword video could be you showing off your collection. It could be you doing some cutting. It could be you showing a form, whatever, right? It could be you having two swords, having a conversation and putting on a soap opera with them, whatever. I don't care. It has to be sword related. <laughs> and you will get bonus entries on these videos as long as you tag the, the, um, the actual fundraiser. And I, I, I have all the details set up right now on, on the specific rules on how you do that. And so you get bonus entries for that. Plus, on top of it, the most popular one by the, uh, the end of the month gets additional bonus entries for it. And we've got some awesome prizes. Uh, I don't want to say too much yet until things are a little more finalized, but Jesse Belsky Stage Swords has agreed to donate something. Yeah. Davis Reproductions has agreed to, to do something. Um, Freelance Academy Press is donating some really awesome books. Uh, We've got some stuff from uh, Therian Arms has agreed to do stuff. There's um, Handmade Revolution has agreed to stuff. There's some pretty awesome prizes. And uh, what I'm going to do in the next few weeks, I'm going to start releasing more and more about the actual prizes uh, leading up to the actual starts of the uh, the event. So that's going to be cool. Yeah, so awesome. And, and if you want to – I love all the Jesse Belsky stuff. So if he's putting up I, – I don't know what he's putting up but I have a feeling that I'm going to have to donate because <laughs> <laughs> man, I just, I just love, I just love that guy. And I, I, his, I like his, everything he does is fantastic. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, like, um, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm, I plan on releasing more and more stuff throughout it. I'm, I'm still ironing out things like, um, the tax stuff. Right. But the basic idea of it, is what I just summed up there. And uh, it'll be ready to go by July 1st, which is when we'll start allowing uh, not only donations, but for people to start doing the videos and all that. Awesome. And I think that that's also about the same time period that Virginia might actually hit phase three of its reopening. (laughs) Uh, We might all be able, well, maybe not Nathan. Sorry, Nathan. We might, <laughs> we might be able. I'm to already see, here. We might be able to see each other. I know Nathan's so far ahead of us. Well, guys, uh, that was awesome. Thank you so much for coming on, Bill. Like, like I said before, you're you're just a wealth of information, and I could listen to you talk all day. But at an hour and a half, I think we kind of have to cap it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, d- wait. Before I go, David and Nathan, is there anything else that you wanted to ask? No. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> well, Bill, thanks very much. I'm going to put a link to the description, link in the description about Swords Without Borders. So if our, any of our viewers at home want to uh, take him up on his fantastic offer, please do. I know I, I will be personally. Uh, so yeah, thanks for coming on and, and hopefully I'll, I'll see you soon. Yeah, I am hoping yeah. it would be. Nice. I'm so excited that I'm seeing people on the screen. So, uh, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's people in person. It's amazing. It's it's like it's like social interaction is something that's inherent to the human species. You or, know what my main training sword has been? It's been my three year old sword right here. This has been my main training tool for the past. <laughs> <three months. laughs> it's amazing. I need swords. Yeah, I know, right? It's 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 like a it's a it's a true loss of just not being able to like actually throw cuts at people. <laughs> <sighs> All right, guys. Well, I guess we're gonna sign off for this week. Catch us next week. We don't have a guest lined up yet, but we should soon. Uh, thanks for joining us, and bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.